Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 149, and on today's show, we have some awesome guests from Facebook. Christopher Shadow and Spencer Ahrens, both software engineers at Facebook on the React team. Got some great announcements today, too, as well. We talked about React, React Native, especially React Native going open source. The announcement came yesterday at Facebook's annual conference for developers, F8, as it's known. We also talked about Flux, Relay, and GraphQL in depth. Great conversation today with those guys from Facebook. We also had some awesome sponsors for the show, CodeShip, TopTal, and DigitalOcean. We'll tell you a bit more about TopTal and DigitalOcean, but our friends at CodeShip, specifically someone who's super impressed with CodeShip and how it helps them ship faster, is a CTO at Product Hunt. And I quote, at Product Hunt, we use CodeShip as the backbone of our team's test and deployment processes. And Andreas has lots of great things to say about CodeShip and the way they help them perform, but specifically... They're using Parallel CI, a brand new feature that helps them deploy 10 times faster. And if you want you and your team to ship faster, you have to run your builds in Parallel. And with Parallel CI, you can now split up your test commands in up to 10 test pipelines. This lets you run your test suite in Parallel and drastically reduce the time it takes to run your builds. They integrate with GitHub and Bitbucket, of course. You can deploy to cloud services like Roku, AWS, and many more. And you can get started today for free with their plan that gives you 100 builds a month and five private projects completely for free. Or you can use our offer code when you upgrade, and that code is the Change Law Podcast. And that's going to get you 20% off any plan you choose for three months. So head to codeship.com slash the change law to get started. And now on to the show. Hey, everybody, we're back. We got uh, the folks from Facebook here talking about React.js. Uh, a lot of other fun stuff that's coming out of React.js, React Native, Flux, Relay, GraphQL, a lot of fun stuff. Christopher, you're here. Uh, and Spencer, you're here. Welcome to the show, my friends. Yeah, glad to be here. Yep, same here. And Jerry, we also got you on the call as well. We can't forget you, man. You're such an Don't awesome forget dude. me, man. No way. We would never forget Jared. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to hear about React. So we've been planning this call, I think, behind the scenes for a better part of a month and a half just trying to pin down the best time to get you guys on the show to talk about what you're doing with React.js. Can can we kind of intro each of you, sort of talk about the React team, and then we'll go into more of an introduction of what like React is and then go into the rest of the story. Yeah, so my name is Christopher, and I heard about React about a year before it was open sourced. And this was Jordan, who showed me a prototype of like some crazy uh, functional uh, uh, libraries that he was working on. And this his whole idea was to, we're going to re-render the entire app on every single update. And this sounded like crazy inefficient on everything, but I realized that if this was efficient, then it will solve like so many problems with uh, so many bugs that we have with apps and that are all related to updates. And so I didn't think about uh, of it like for two weeks. And then I was like, oh, maybe I should try it. And I tried it. And even if it was like super alpha, it was extremely fast, like faster than uh, my manual dump manipulation I could write. And I was like hooked that day. And so for basically like a year, I convinced like my entire team and like all the org uh, to use React. And I helped on the open source uh, effort. And this is how I got involved. And Spencer, how about yourself? Uh, so I definitely came from a, a different perspective. Um, so I was actually uh, managing the um, Facebook newsfeed teams on uh, iOS and Android at the time. And uh, we were struggling with dealing with this massive app with hundreds of contributors. And um, our compile times had gotten astronomical. And it was, it was very slow to, uh, to iterate on the app and fix bugs and, and move things forward. Um, and then I found out from um, some of these guys that had been hacking on this new React Native thing uh, after React JS was pretty, um, pretty, you know, getting pretty mature internally, uh, and it was it was very impressive. They had this like ultra fast reload, um, so you could just change your product code and reload it right away, and all this kind of good stuff. And I was like, oh man, we need this. So I switched from management back to uh, coding. 
uh, as an engineer and joined the project full time to try and make it a, a reality uh, internally and uh, eventually uh, for the community um, as open source. Awesome. So maybe step back a second. Let's talk about React itself and uh, what it is. We've been tracking it on the changelog for some time, and you can't ignore the groundswell of excitement around certain no, projects. <laughs> this is one that's just been slowly building steam, and uh, everybody is is quite excited about. So, uh, why don't y'all take this one? Uh, what is it exactly, and then why are people so excited about it? Yeah. So, what it is? It's a library to build user interfaces, and this is a big world, and this is not a framework or anything, but this is a way for you to build, to write uh, user interfaces. And for user interfaces, it's basically like the DOM. So divs and spans and like events. And the way you write this is the first big fundamental pillar is it's in JavaScript. So there is no templating language. Like you don't have to use strings. Like this is pure JavaScript. And you use JavaScript to create objects that are going to be rendered. And one of the big twists is that you don't have an update function. So usually when you build your interfaces, you first render everything, and then you have to hook up all the events, and when something changes, you got to find the right element and then modify it. And the really magical aspect of React is you're going to re-render like all the time, and inside of React is going to do a diff between the previous version you re-rendered and the next version you rendered. And it's only going to apply like those small mutations. And the great thing is that because it's so focused on only doing this, then you can integrate it like everywhere on, on top of like any platform. So for example, at Facebook, we had like many different libraries and framework and ways to access data. And we were able to plug React like everywhere. And in open source, like this is the same. And the great thing is this is not only about the browser, about the DOM it's abstract enough to render any tree. And so we used it to render iOS tree and Android tree uh, with React Native. So this is like the two minutes uh, intro of React. Uh -huh. Yeah, a lot of things that come out of this, uh, virtual DOM, service object rendering, descriptive warnings, custom event systems, yeah. things like that are what uh, sort of people clamor to. This came out of the ad org and really has done a lot for the business itself. Yeah. One of the other things was predictability and being confident with change. Can you talk a little bit about the predictability that came from this and how that's helped engineers be more, more efficient and being able to have confident changes? One of the great um, success stories of React was an early one, um, which was that the, um, the ads product uh, interface where um, like small business owners and stuff would go to the website to, to place ads and manage their campaign and stuff um, was an extremely complex web application. Um, and there's tons of different features and all sorts of stuff you can do. Um, and it had turned into this giant labyrinth um, that was extremely difficult to change without causing some sort of side effect bug um, somewhere else in the, in the application um, because of this kind of imperative style of like going in and manipulating different parts of the DOM and having to update a whole bunch of cascading bits of state here and there um, because you just changed one, one bit. And so when the, when the team um, basically rebuilt it in React, um, they found that their uh, rate of new bugs being introduced um, had gone through the floor. So there was very few bugs um, coming into the system in the first place. And then also when, um, when a bug did come in, um, it was much easier to figure out what was going wrong and make a targeted fix um, really quickly. Um, so bugs were resolved very quickly and with, without a lot of frustration. Uh, and then it even went to the point that um, new people uh, coming into the company, very fresh, maybe straight out of uh, college, uh, actually felt comfortable in the code base because they could understand what was going on because the, this declarative nature and um, componentization of the code, um, they could say like, oh, this is clearly what's going to happen if I make this change. And they didn't have to you know, have years of experience with like the whole labyrinthine system in order to feel like they're not going to break something uh, by jumping into the code and adding a feature or um, fixing a, a bug or something like that. Um, so that helped the team grow and move a lot faster and uh, make a much more stable uh, product that um, our advertisers really appreciated. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense from an approachability standpoint for developers. I'm curious how designers take to it. Um, people who are used, used to only working with HTML and CSS, because as you said, it's all JavaScript. 
components seem to break out really nicely. So in that regard, I think it would be more approachable perhaps than other systems. But um, how do you work a designer into uh, the flow of you know, working with React? Yeah, so one of the interesting things about Facebook is uh, designers do not contribute to the code base. So designers do like okay. mocks and like use like Quartz Composer to do like really nice interaction and interactivities, but they don't actually like go in the code base and change things. So this has not mm-hmm. been an issue like at Facebook. But okay. uh, Instagram, we, which we acquired uh, a few years ago, on the other side, like the designers do change code uh, regularly. And mm-hmm. like if you look at uh, JSX and the component system, like this looks familiar enough to be uh, like HTML. So they were basically able to like jump in and like make design changes like really easily. And also one other thing I think we should talk about is like designers are not like inferior people that cannot uh, like code. Sure. Like there's this notion that designer, like if it's JavaScript, like this is the end of the world, they cannot like do anything. And this is not true. Like I would say like the previous environment of like developing environment was too hard. So you had to like spend a lot of time being trying to like write JavaScript. And what we've tried to do with React is to make it as simple as possible. And this is not like trying to do the lowest, like uh, trying to appeal like the masses, but this is to try to make a really good engineer even more efficient. And using mm-hmm. this approach, we found that it was making like the lib- library a lot more approachable and designer like didn't need to like weeks of training to be able to jump in the code base and change it. That makes sense. Uh, you mentioned JSX. Yeah. Can you unpack that for us? So JSX is a syntax extension for JavaScript that instead of doing function calls to uh, render your application, you use uh, brackets, yeah, angle brackets, angle bracket. uh, that looks like HTML. So the origin of JSX is back in the days in PHP uh, version of Facebook, uh, we had a big security issue. So we used to use string concatenation in order to build the interface. And as you know, when you concatenate strings, uh, it's super easy to introduce XSS vulnerabilities. We were basically just echoing out the strings. Yeah. (laughs) And... Mm. Like, we, we couldn't solve this problem, and, like, someone from the uh, security team uh, came up with this syntax extension from PHP. So instead of um, using string literals to, like, write HTML, he augmented the syntax of PHP to write angle brackets and, like, being able to add attributes. And the interesting thing about this is now, because it's inside of the syntax of the language, we know everything which is syntax is HTML and needs uh, to be rendered as is, but everything else needs to be escaped. And so it solved all of the issues, all of the like excesses vulnerability issues that were on the, web- on the website. And so this was a big win for security, but it turned out that now that you have like this uh, like PHP object to uh, render those elements, now we are able to like write custom tags, custom elements, and so this is how we started with all the component efforts. And now we're using like uh, components and to render like the uh, PHP part, part of Facebook, uh, like the entire Facebook app. And, now, and afterward, we ported it to JavaScript, which is JSX and React. Is JSX an optional uh, component or is it a required piece of React? Yeah, it's optional. Um, it actually, there's just a, a static transform that translates it into the actual function calls it's making behind the scenes. And so you can just call those directly if you want um, and skip the JSX. Okay, so there's a build step. Yep. Is that part of some tooling that you guys have released as well? or? Yep, there's a JSX binary that adds a transform step to do it. And the interesting thing is because this is not uh, required, then other languages that compile to JS, for example, ClojureScript or CoffeeScript, they are able to use React, but without the JS export. Hmm. And since React is really just a, a view layer, I've, I haven't tried it myself, hmm. but you, it seems like you can fit it in with, with many other toolkits like an Angular or an Ember if you are so inclined. Is that fair to say? Yeah, you can definitely mix and match. And um, because also React components are componentized, you can kind of 
stick them into the tree wherever you want. So that's how it initially got adopted at Facebook, um, is that we had all this other crazy stuff going on. But you could be like, oh, I want to try this React thing. And you could just re-implement one little widget on your page, uh, and they would they would play nice together. Yeah, Very that was cool. the initial implementation of React in Facebook was the comments feed, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so you can just pick a piece of the page and shove it in there and yeah. kind of is isolated. That makes it really easy to... To pick it up and give it a shot without having to go whole right. hog yeah. into it. Yeah, definitely. Sure. And also, like, it's a tool level, so you can embed it anywhere you want. But inside of React, you can also uh, make a component that is uh, just a jQuery a plugin or like some arbitrary node. So you can like plug it in. Uh, you can have your custom uh, code base on top of React and below React as well. Awesome. Well, I want to ask you about React Native. We're pretty excited about it. But let's pause first, uh, hear a word from a sponsor, and when we get back, we'll talk about React Native. I want to share a more personal note today with you about our awesome sponsor, TopTile. You've heard us talk about TopTile several times. For long-time listeners, you know that TopTile has been supporting the show for the better part of a year to a year and a half now. Uh, if you want to go to their website while I'm talking here, it's T-O-P. TAL.com. It's one of the best places to work as a freelance software developer. Uh, we've been working with TopTal, like I said, for about a year, year and a half now. And over this year and a half, I've gotten to know their co founder, Brendan, very, very well. I love what they're doing for the software development community. They care deeply about software developers having awesome engagements to work on. And they also care about awesome engagements having really awesome software engineers to work with them. Uh, so they really make the marriage between a business with great opportunities and an engineer needing great opportunities to work on. They make that marriage possible. Well, we took our relationship to the next level and went there ourselves. We're building something very cool behind the scenes here at the Change Log to power the future of what we're becoming. You're going to love what we're doing. We hired a software engineer through TopTal. His name's Rafael. So if you're a member and you're in the members only Slack room, say hi to Rafael. He's in there. Uh, but I wanted to tell you just how deeply we care about our relationship with TopTal and how much we trust who they are. And if you're freelancing right now as a software developer and you're looking for a way to work with top clients, maybe even us, on projects that are interesting to you, challenging, uh, and using the technologies you want to use, I will go as far to say that TopTal is the place for you. Head to toptal.com slash developers. That's toptal.com slash developers to learn more and tell them the change will sent you. So you mentioned earlier that you have these components, and you have this declarative way of defining the components, and you've kind of abstracted that away from the actual rendering. And what falls out from that is the ability to render not just to the DOM, but to other view layers. I think it was Flipboard who came out with React Canvas, uh, kind of to much applause and to some controversy around, you know, is the web technologies good enough <laughs> for 60 frames per second, uh, which is always fun to talk about. But you guys have taken that a step further. They're rendering it to Canvas, and you guys at your conference in January, I believe it was, announced React Native. Can you want to talk about that for us? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the general concept is that you still just have a view hierarchy, right? It just happens to be like UI kit, um, like UI views, or Android views, um, or DOM nodes. Um, and the, the same React principles, React algorithms, um, they all apply to to each of them. Um, and so basically there's a, a bridge layer that translates the JavaScript to the native platform. Uh, and then you have kind of like a CRUD interface of, you know, create, update, and, you know, we just use that to add nodes um, into the system, modify them, set properties, delete them. Yeah, and the rest is, um, you know, a bunch of platform-specific um, native stuff to um, make the system work. So that's kind of the basic idea. When... Uh... When you came out with React Native, uh, from what I understand, it's getting the best part out of Native, but also getting the best part out of the web as well. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so one of the main things that was slowing us down on Native, uh, I mean, we could build you know beautiful apps that, that performed really well and were really great, but it was just a lot slower uh, to develop and iterate. A lot of this was because our build times had gotten really slow, but... You know, just in general, it's it's not the web where you can just rapidly prototype and reload the page and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, we we look to um, be able to to solve this simultaneously, get the the performance and the the platform standardization of the native side, but then also the ease of development on the website with being able to reload. Uh, we also brought some other abstractions, including a layout system 
uh, and styling. So now you can um, write something similar to CSS uh, that's actually pure JavaScript to style your nodes, uh, similar to like style sheets. Uh, and you can use the Flexbox um, layout algorithms to lay out your nodes. So now instead of the, the standard, like especially on iOS of, you know, actually com- doing a bunch of algebra or um, arithmetic to calculate how the views should be laid out on the screen. Um, you can just say like, you know, flex direction row or column and they'll automatically like stack up. Um, they'll stretch to fill their parent or wrap text and all these kind of things um, that you're used to on the web, um, which also takes a lot of the burden out of the kind of traditional um, native development. So it sounds like it's maybe yet another preprocessor. So is that what you're talking about when it comes to an alternate way of doing style sheets? The way React works is the only interface with a DOM is uh, three operations. One, which is uh, create a DOM node and attach it somewhere in the DOM. The second one is update this DOM node. And the third one is uh, delete, remove the, the DOM node. And in uh, before that, there's an older React diff algorithm that outputs those three things. And so we are still using JavaScript and we're still using React and all of this, but we re-implemented those three operations. Instead of doing it for the DOM, we send them uh, from JavaScript to Objective-C. And in Objective-C, we create a view, we modify the view, and we remove the view. Hmm. Does it make yeah, sense? It totally makes sense. So, hmm, so you're not running a web view inside of a native app. It's not like a wrapper. It's actually just real native rendering components. native yeah. components. And so what's so the goal, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to understand the big win. Is it just that you can use the web technologies which you know and love? Or is it cross platform or what's what's the biggest win? So Jordan, who created React and was at the beginning of React Native, is obsessed with performance. And for like months he tried to get a 60 FPS list, like infinite scrolling list like Newsfeed on the web. And he couldn't get it to work as uh, fast, fast enough. And so huh. uh, what he tried is he took the React native, like our very early experiment, and used the exact same code. But instead of rendering uh, divs and spans and images, uh, he rendered UI view, UI image, and UI label. And without changing anything, he got 60 FPS without even trying. And so huh. this is how like the project really really started. We had a confirmation that the browser is not like fast enough. Uh-huh. Uh, this is like how it started. And then we were able to get a lot of wins because it turns out that all of the native UI components from uh, iOS are extremely well designed and well made and like all the gestures are, are right and are, are very high quality. And while it's theoretically possible to implement those uh, on the web. Like, I've never seen anyone uh, do it as well as the native counterparts. And so by being able to reuse them by default, uh, this is a big win for the project. And it also, uh, it's also interesting because I would say it's a broken glass effect. So because like all of the core components are so high quality and so well made, like the iOS community are extreme is extremely like careful about making like really well designed interactions and things like this. But if you look at the web, because there's no such example, like it's okay to ship like inferior quality app. And we've seen this like even at Facebook, like on the website, like we could make it a lot better, but we haven't done so because like we were not pushed far enough by the platform and the like mentality and the ecosystem. So you're saying the web has some broken windows. Yeah. And so we're all just kind of adjusting <laughs> to fit that ecosystem. Yeah. I think, you also asked uh, about re- the... Uh, that yeah, resonates definitely. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you also asked about the cl- cross-platform nature. Um, yes, yeah. So one of, the, one of the big advantages we've seen is that um, now there's one unified development experience um, independent of what platform you're running on. So... You learn JavaScript, you learn React, and you learn some of these like style sheet concepts and abstractions. And that travels with you to whatever platform you're working on. Of course, the platforms yeah. also have a lot of uh, platform-specific idioms, right? So the actual design and, and the way the app like looks and feels and 
uh, the way navigation works and those kind of things are unique. Um, but now the actual code that you're writing and the way you're working and the, the tools that you're using uh, are much more consistent. And so you can have um, the same developers more easily moving between platforms uh, as they build out a similar experience on, on multiple um, devices or operating systems or, or what have you. Um, we also have the flexibility that we can reshare whichever code we'd like to. It very rarely makes sense to share all of the code, um, but uh-huh. like the lower levels of application logic, like business logic, is usually the same, uh, and it's decoupled from the view layer, right? Uh, and so that code can all just be shared across the applications, and then you can decide you know, where in the stack you want to re-implement um, the, the presentation. Uh, and so we've actually been able to move around pretty quickly across platforms without spinning up um, more specialized people um, that you know know the intricacies of the the Android runtime and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also, I want to add something on this, which is if like people like I was on the Photos team, and we had one big issue, which uh, which was that uh, developers on iOS could not uh, write anything on Android, could not write anything on the web. So we had whenever we wanted to do uh, like a new feature we had to staff three different people to work on the exact same thing. And the issue with this is now it makes like silos. So now like there's iOS engineers that are thinking about iOS and like this mentality and they don't talk to Android engineers and they don't talk to web engineers. And so not only it takes three times the amount of energy to build features, but you also like, get a lot less communication between zoos and like they get uh, further apart. And this is not good because now it's, you're, you're putting people at war between each other. Like now, instead of like having everyone wanted to like build the best product now, oh, you're co- going to compare between iOS and Android, oh, I'm the best. Or... And also as a mentality effect, if it's not really fun to re- implement the same thing as someone else. Because like you want to do like mm-hmm. something unique, and now like if you think it's best, now you've got to convince the two other people that they also should do that, and so like it <laughs> causes like a lot of I issues, bet. like uh, people issues. Well, then you yeah. got you can't just it, yeah you have to have so many people to implement a single feature because simply because of platform differences, you're not really trying to do a right once, you know, run everywhere kind of situation, which is what Tom said in his keynote. You're really trying yeah. to do – everyone understands how to use React, and React can work everywhere. So it's not like write once, oh, yeah. put it everywhere. It's more like learn it once and then do it everywhere, write it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah which really yeah, – sorry. I was going to say it really breaks down knowledge silos inside of an organization and brings all the engineers yeah, on the same That page. seems really great too for team building too, right? Because you've got really yep. smart people on three different sides of the fence basically that are in their own silos and can't really – mesh together, get lunch together, talk through features together, and really even take it above and beyond the bar that you're already going to because they're in their they're in their silos and sort of camping on their own areas. Yeah. And those experts also tend to be more fragmented themselves because now you're you're spreading the products across more people because you have the platform specific verticals, yeah. right? And so now instead of having one engineer that knows how to build this product super well on all platforms, you'll have three engineers that know how to build three different products each on their own platform, right? Um, and so now any individual engineer is fragmented across PMs, designers, projects, that kind of yeah. thing, uh, which is... Con- continuity, better team building, that's, um, that's, that's definitely the way to go. Jared, you got a question? Yeah, I'm just now starting to think, man, like in a practical sense, like using React Native, you, 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 I'm wanting to get my hands on it now because... <laughs> I'm thinking, like, how do you use this thing? Is it like, are you chilling? Like, if you're doing an iOS app in React Native, are you chilling inside Xcode? Are you are you just having some JavaScript files and you have some sort of build tool? Like, how does it work? So the way it works is most of it for the develop, the random developer is going to be uh, JavaScript. So mostly going to write JavaScript and React, and internally we use Atom uh, for debugging, but a lot of people use Sublime. And well, I'm here. That, <laughs> I use Sublime. Uh, yeah. And so this is like for the random developer. But then what we really want is you can access every single feature of native that you want. And the way we did it was to implement a plugin system 
that lets you write arbitrary Objective-C or Java. And this means that if, for example, Apple ships a feature on APIs that is not available yet for a new uh, upgrade, like you can, you can like bridge it. It's going to be a bit like verbose and complicated, but like you can do it. And also it's really useful for being able to run like really high performance things. For example, like image decoding. While there is ASMJS and like this kind of thing, like at this point, like it adds a layer of indirection and you want to be able to use a real thing with threads and with uh, malloc and like controlling like the very low level. So, but then like this is a use case for like more advanced. So you're going to like do it less, but this is really what makes it stand out from the web as it is right now. Yeah, so you have that that full power of the plugin system to write whatever modules you want. So you can just write, you know, random files that are, you know, just have some JS function you call it executes the native thing, or you can actually wrap um, like view components. So say you know you already have an app and you wrote some really cool widget that you you know don't want to just throw the code away. Um, you can actually just bridge it right into your React Native app and make it available, so you don't have to um, just throw all that out. Or if you know there's something about it that you need more closer access to, like the native APIs, um, you can do that if you need. But because it is this, uh, we made it as easy as possible to um, bridge in these these like new like plugins. Um, we're also hoping that the community can kind of expand that surface area really easily as well, and we can kind of build like a, a community supported library of all sorts of neat like widgets and you know native capabilities and and things like that that are really easy to just kind of drop into your app. Well, now that we got pretty much everybody excited about that, let's let's get them excited about something else as well. You've got some dates, some dates coming up that are pretty important to you. What what's going to happen on those days, and what's so important to you? Yeah, so yesterday we we open sourced uh, React Native, so as of today, like you should be able to like just go on GitHub and uh, npm install and like start to use it. That's now that's a, that's exciting. So technically. Technically, Christopher, you're speaking in the future to the past. Yes. Because we're re- recording yes. this in the past, but you're listening to this on a Friday, which is March 27th. So on the March 26th, Facebook announced React Native and it's open source. Well, you, you announced it a while ago, but it's open source now. Yeah, you guys announced it back in January. And here we are in March. It seems like was there just some cleanup that had to be done, some extraction that that you had to pull it out? Yeah. So the story behind this is... Uh, we organized a React JS comp, and we had no plan of like open sourcing React Native, and we were like we wanted to open source it at some point, but like we were not ready. And one month before the conference, we were like, "This is like the best place to announce it. Like there's yeah. no better place." And so like we were like, uh, "Like there's no way in one month we're going to be able to like make it uh, open source ready." So what we did was. We're going to like clean up as much as possible and see the dates where we are. And we were not ready, so we were like, okay, we can we are ready enough for like people to try it, but not everyone. So we gave it gave access to attendees at the conference. And then we're like, okay, we're going to run to work as fast as possible to make it ready. And now we're able to get like something that we are proud of. Even if it's like super early, like you can like start building up with it. Yeah, uh, everyone at the conference who was at React Conf back in January got access to the GitHub repo. So you had a private. Yep. It was already on GitHub, but you kind of gave access early to those attendees. Yeah. But yesterday, uh, March 26th, you, you actually open sourced it to the world. That's correct. Yep. And this was not a really good place, and I don't recommend like doing the same thing because like – this is like People were storming yeah. the gates, weren't they? Yeah, and this is like making so much hype, and like yeah. we really want like people to try it and see for themselves instead of like listening to us saying that like, this is the best thing in the world. And this is what we've been trying to do with React: is this is what we think, but like please try it and make an opinion for yourself. When you say try, do you mean yeah. try it as in use it, or try it as in like build something with it? Because obviously they couldn't build something with it. But to try it, they could use uh, Facebook groups was was your first, as, as far as I can tell, was your first usage internally of, of React, of building yeah. brand new, or React Native, sorry. Yeah, so I would say like, yeah, I would say both. Like try to develop something with it. And if you're not convinced, try the groups app or the ads manager app. And one interesting thing about the groups app is it's half React Native and it's half 
uh, objective, like just normal Objective C. And what's interesting is try the app and see if you can detect which one is native and which one is React native. And if you cannot find out the difference, then it means that we've done a good job. This means that we are able to write. I can't apps. tell the difference. So you did a good job. <laughs> I use it. I've been playing with the groups because um, here in my neighborhood, we actually have a Facebook group that we use for our neighborhood. And it's a mate, you know, it's, it's good for getting to know your neighbor for one and just kind of keeping in touch with what's going on in the neighborhood. But yep. we're, me and my wife were always on it, just kind of keeping up with our neighbors and whatnot. So that's one of the groups I use quite a bit on Facebook. So I was like, oh, that's a good thing. And I've been using it for a couple of days now and really been enjoying the push notifications. And I can't mm-hmm. tell it's not that it's a half and half app at all. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that's the goal. I think, I think one of the reasons why people, people got so excited is that, you know, this, this is not an R and D project. I mean, it started off as one a while back, but uh, one thing that I appreciate about what you guys do over there at Facebook with your open source is, you know, you do wait and you do use it in production and you kind of, you know, the, you know, the term is dog fooding. Of course, we've heard that plenty of times, but you're actually like, you have production apps that use React Native. This is not like, hey, this might be a thing that works. It's like, nope, this is really a thing that works and we're using it. And so that makes the announcement so much more tangible and people want to get their hands on it because you can actually do production things with that today. Yeah, and we that's, have a- that's super exciting. We have a very firm commitment to our open source uh, portfolio to only launch things that we really believe are, are very useful, work well, um, at least for our internal use cases, uh, but also that we think will be useful to the community as well. And so, you know, React Native is one of those. If we ended up not using it internally, we wouldn't have open sourced it because, you know, there must have been something not quite there about it. Uh-huh. Paper doesn't use React Native, does it? No, Paper uses a, another uh, library that we did open source called Async Display Kit. Uh, and so that came before uh, React Native was um, even a, a thing at all internally. And actually, React Native is, is starting to think of a lot of like, similar optimizations that we can make inspired by the Async Display Kit uh, open source library. For example, one of the things that traditionally makes apps slow or drop frames or whatever is doing the layout synchronously on the UI thread. And if you have a lot of complex layout to compute, uh, it can take longer than one frame, and then you miss your frame deadline and drop a frame. What Async, Async Display Kit did uh, for paper is uh, make it really easy to compute your layout on a separate thread uh, and allocate nodes and, and do all this kind of stuff uh, in the background without blocking your UI thread. Uh, and React Native gives you a similar capability. So we mentioned earlier that we have this Flexbox style uh, layout paradigm. Um, so you, you know, you write like flexbox style rules in your styles, and then the system computes the, the layout, like the frame positions and all that. All of that layout calculation is also done on a background thread um, rather than on the main thread. So even if your layout is very complex and it takes a few frames to compute, we're not going to be blocking, you know, your scroll or whatever while that happens. Um, so we have, you know, kind of a synergy between our different, um, different libraries, even if they're not actually sharing any code. Um, just based on their their time lineage. So React Native supports iOS and Android out of the box. Any other platforms that support or in the pipeline? Yeah, so Android hasn't shipped yet. Um, we're working on an app okay. now, uh, and it's not part of the open source yet. Um, but okay. we're we're working very hard to to ship that app and uh, and get it into the the open source for the community. So for the release, the initial release is iOS first, then Android later. Yeah. Yeah. And this goes okay. back to your question, like to your remark that we only open source things that we use in production. We don't yeah. have an Android in production, so it doesn't make sense yet to open source it. And right now we don't have any other plans, but we really designed the systems to be uh, modular. So it shouldn't be that hard. Like it's going to be a lot of work, but like the system is designed to support like uh, Windows Phone, like. Then, then or something like if you have like other OSX. other platforms and we we see it with react react there's a react canvas uh, backend there's some people that did the uh, react OpenGL uh, backend some uh, svg backend so mm. like this is open ended especially you mentioned something there that stuck kind of kind of had earmarked to talk about which was the the blocking portion of a garbage collection of JavaScript running that in the same, the main thread yeah. and what that means for frame rate. And Jared, you, mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier about 
um, Flipbook and React Canvas and whatnot. Flipboard. Flipboard. What, what did I yep. say? Flipbook. Flipbook. <laughs> <laughs> a little close. Yeah, that's pretty close. Close enough. Yeah. I, I don't use Flipboard, so that's why it's a Flipbook to me. Facebook, Flipbook, you know, it, we're, we're all about the books around here. Uh, my bad. But, you know, talk about the non-blocking aspect on things like garbage collection and what that means for frame rate and what that means for the animations and transitions that, that uh, React Native allow. Yeah, so right now, um, like I said, the layout and all that is done on a background thread, but all the JavaScript is also executed on a background thread. Uh, so the way the system is architected is that everything um, goes across a serializable asynchronous bridge uh, between the, the native runtime and the, the JavaScript engine. So this means we're, we're not doing any um, like custom uh, like synchronous hooks. Um, it's literally just serializing the commands um, into JSON and passing those back and forth. Uh, so that means the JS can take as long as it needs to to compute um, a batch, uh, and the the interface is free to you know scroll and respond while that's happening. Um, obviously, if you have critical things with React with uh, JS in the loop, you know then it it can get stalled. Um, and right now, we've done a lot to make sure that's not the case. Um, but we'd like to actually lift that restriction and potentially introduce some. Uh, multi-threaded JavaScript architectures and um, some other optimizations there so that we can make it a little bit easier to run critical sessions uh, in your JavaScript. Um, yeah. And also you mentioned uh, garbage collection. And we were super afraid at the beginning that, oh, we're using JavaScript, we're going to be hit by the garbage collector. But it turns out this has never been an issue so far. Like we've never uh, dropped a frame because of it. And one of the reasons is we're using JavaScript core and it has a, a multi-threaded uh, garbage collector, and it's concurrent so that your JavaScript can run, and the garbage collection is going to run at the same time. It's not going to block, except for the sweep phase. But the sweep phase is chunked and has a, de- had a deadline limit. So in practice, this hasn't been uh, an issue. That's, that's um, good to mention that because... The show just before this, episode 148, um, Jared wasn't on the call, but I had a call on on the topic of Go with Andrew Geron. And one mm-hmm. of the things they're doing with Go is uh, is opening up to be able, going to mobile, more or less, mm-hmm. iOS and Android support. And one of the things we talked about was the concurrency in Go and garbage collection and, and the importance of that and how that sort of pauses the application or pauses that thread. And even for a few milliseconds of 10 milliseconds, Yep. And then that provides that, that pause that sort of drops your frame rate. Next thing you know, your transitions aren't the way they should be. Your animations get blocked and you have sort of a kludgy UI and a kludgy UX. So that's a, a pretty important feature there. We're going to take a quick break, come back and talk about Flux, Relay and GraphQL, some highly important topics that are pretty fun to talk about. So we'll be back in just a sec. Over 400,000 developers have deployed to DigitalOcean's cloud. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider built for developers. In 55 seconds, that's all the time it takes, you'll have a cloud server with full root access, and it just doesn't get any easier than that. Pricing plans are super inexpensive, just 5 bucks a month for half of your RAM, 20 gigs of SSD drive space, 1 CPU core, and 1 terabyte of transfer. All DigitalOcean servers run on SSDs, that means they're blazing fast. They have tier 1 bandwidth support and come with private networking. Use our special link to get a $10 hosting credit when you sign up, head to thechangelog.com slash digitalocean to get started. And now back to the show. All right, we're back. Flux, Relay, GraphQL. Where should we begin with, with these three topics here? Yeah, maybe with Flux. So the history of Flux is uh, the team that was working on uh, method, uh, on chat, uh, they had one big issue, which was updates were out of sync. So for example, uh, you had a notification, a chat notification, someone sent a message, and you, you need to like update the, the chat tab at the bottom right of the screen and the buddy list at the right of the screen and the notification icon and like many other places in the UI. And the way it was organized before it, anytime there was an update, you needed like manually in the code to go to all of those places and, and modify the DOM nodes. And this was horrible because uh, things were getting out of sync and all the time, and it was super hard to know why and to troubleshoot the issues. And so the idea that they had is 
we're going to have a centralized place where we're going to have all our data. And we're going to use something called a one-way data flow. So instead of having like the model that talks to the view, that talks to the model, that talks to, uh, to the controller and like in all of those places, there's going to be only one way to do it. When the view, there's an event on the view that changes, you're going to send an action to the model and the model is going to call the view again. And like only, it only goes in this one direction. And it solved like all of the issue. But what it meant is that they had to re-render the entire thing like basically all the time. And in parallel, there was this React library that we, was, we were working on at Facebook, which was like, we're going to re-render everything all the time and it's going to be fast enough. And the two like actually converged. So, and they were a good fit together. So you can use like the one-way data flow architecture of Flux with React to render and they work like really well together. So Flux was, uh, it's kind of an, would you consider it an architecture yep. or an implement? Yeah. And it's not a specific tool. It's a way of going about things similar to how model view controller would be a way of, yep. of organizing your application. That being said, you guys, you know, Flux is a thing that you guys do with your uh, web apps and your React apps. And so you and you, you provided Flux as kind of a, was there a specification or just a, some documentation on how a Flux application will work? Yep. And then you guys had your own implementation? Yeah, so uh, we have a website, uh, uh, facebook.github.io slash Flux. And mm -hmm. we have only one part of like source code, which is a dispatcher. And then the rest is like documentation of how we design the system internally. But mm. like this is like create actions and mutation and things like this. And like it's basically like a way for you to architect your app, but like there's no specific code. But is that because it's so application specific the way you end up going about it? Yeah, like there's no like stores, there's, there's just uh, JavaScript objects and actions, mm. there's just a JSON payload. So. Mm. Like there's not that much code, but there's a lot of uh, Flux libraries that try to implement the Flux pattern. We will give like more concrete things, so you may want to start with them if you want. Yeah, there's a whole list of them. Yahoo has one. Yeah. The best thing about these is the names that came out of it. So <laughs> you got Flux, you got Reflux, Flumex, Marty.js, of course, yeah. uh, McFly. Material flux. <laughs> you got uh, a whole ecosystem of flux uh, implementations, and in fact, I think we even covered in weekly a flux comparison, which is a repo on GitHub. If you search yeah. flux dash comparison, a guy who basically went and implemented the same app uh, across all these different fluxes. <laughs> so yeah, what interesting... vibrant, vibrant ecosystem of, of flux, isn't there? Not yeah. One interest of oh, the interesting thing is so when we open source React, like we. Uh, we just said like, oh, we're using like this internally, like Flux, and we on IRC we were talking about it, but like we didn't care that much because we just wanted to focus on the view. But like the demand was mm -hmm. so crazy, and so uh, when an engineer at Facebook like just did a blog post about Flux, just saying like how it's working, so that people can have a reference, and like everybody <laughs> jumped on it. Like this was yeah. like if Facebook was the messiah, and like this was the way to go. So. <laughs> I would say like this is like this went a bit overboard, and so this is how we are doing it, and it's working well. And we hope it's going to work well for you. But like again, like we don't know your specific use case. Yeah, and then you guys um, shortly thereafter started talking about another thing, which seems to be I don't know if you call it a spiritual successor or maybe just inspired yeah. by Flux. It's it's this is actually a framework now. This mm -hmm. is not just. In architecture, it's called Relay, yep. um, an unreleased framework announced probably around the same time as React Native, which appears to be kind of doing the same stuff that Flux, you know, is architected to do as far as actions, data fetching, so yeah. on. So a lot Can you of talk the, about Relay, yeah, a lot of the philosophies are very similar, right? It has the the one way data flow and and these kind of things, having the centralized store for all your data. Um, but uh, one of the one of the problems we ran into with the Flux architecture was keeping our client and server code in sync, right? So um, mm. 
especially like the way our like chat system was was engineered, is that basically the server endpoint, there was just one, um, would basically have to prepare all of the data that the client could potentially want, right? And package that all up and then ship it down to the client in one big bundle. And if you, you know, changed anything on the client, it was very difficult to make certain that, you know, that data is, um, you know, going to be available from the server. Uh, and then when you're looking at the server, like, oh, man, we're fetching all this stuff. Like, is some of this wasteful? Can we get rid of it? It was very difficult to f- make sure that that piece of data is never going to be accessed by the client. Right. And so keeping those in sync was very difficult and it led to bloating the responses because in order to be safe and um, make sure we didn't introduce bugs, um, we were more conservative with removing data from the payload. Uh, And so what um, Relay, um, which is tightly coupled to GraphQL, uh, enables us to do is that the client actually specifies every single piece of data that it wants uh, with the query. And so it basically requests it explicitly from the server like, you know, I want, you know, the actor and I want their name and I want the, their hometown and their phone number, uh, but I don't care about their birthday or whatever, right? Uh, and then the mm-hmm. server can uh, prepare that request specifically for that client and send it exactly what it asked for. Uh, and so now the overfetching problem is gone, the synchronization problem is gone, uh, and, you know, the, the interaction there ends up being a lot more efficient and easier to work with. What that also means... Yeah, it kind of acts as a, a wrapper around the React component, right? And so because of that, it's just waiting on that data. It's kind of a prerequisite yeah. for the component to render. So React can basically just chill there, wait till it's all resolved, and then finally render. You kind of you shake out a lot of complexity in dealing with transition states and loading spinners and stuff like that, right? Exactly, yeah. The React component declares exactly what data it needs from the server, and then the Relay framework um, makes sure that uh, all of the different components that are going to be rendered together in that page load or um, that view, um, it, it combines all of their data fetching into one um, one query and then fetches that in a batch. Uh, and then it also manages updates and all these kind of things. So if you uh, you know if you're doing an infinitely scrolling list and you want to uh, like scroll load some more data, it'll handle like you know, fetch, like changing the cursors for the, the query uh-huh. and appending that data and then updating only the components um, that need the updated data and, and things like that. So, And you say it's tied to GraphQL, which to me I think is like, you know, you have REST and now you have this other way of querying yeah. an API. Yeah, so the idea, that is? the idea behind GraphQL is, so the REST endpoint, it gives you like the path to an, to an element but it doesn't say what attributes you want from the element. And so what GraphQL does is it lets you specify the path, like the exact set of attributes that you want. And another benefit of GraphQL is, by nature, this is uh, hierarchical. So you can like dip down, like you, you can dip down many times, and it solves the program called n plus one fetching problem. So if you want to fetch a list, and then each element of the list, and for each element, like another list. Uh, if you are using the traditional REST endpoint, you first need to fetch the list, and then do uh, 20 queries for each element, and then for each element, do like 20 other queries. And GraphQL makes it all go into one single query. So whereas a, you, you normally would get a singular REST resource, this is like grabbing a tree, basically. Yeah. And you get it all in one query, which is great for performance. Yeah. Is and GraphQL what you guys just you guys just came up with that? Is this uh, is there prior art or is yeah, so, this in the wild out there? So the history of GraphQL is uh, when we re-implemented uh, the iOS app from uh, web to native, we needed a way to like fetch data, and what we needed was to like get a JSON, and like the engineers working on GraphQL that invented them saying like, oh, but I know I want this JSON. So what I'm going to do is just going to remove all the values and keep like the shape and they decided that this was GraphQL. And this is like as simple as this. And mm-hmm. they've been using it on the Newsfeed iOS for like three years now. And on the and it spread like all the iOS app is using GraphQL, the Android app is using GraphQL. And the reason oh. why we didn't talk about it yet is because if you want to implement GraphQL, you need to change your entire backend because now your backend has to uh, talk GraphQL. And we didn't think it was like, 
worth enough, like changing your backend just for GraphQL, like without any library. But now that we are integrating GraphQL with Relay, we think like the benefit is like big enough so that we can like convince people to use, like to change their backend to use GraphQL because like their code is going to be much better. So GraphQL, you guys obviously have your own implementation if you've been running it in production for a few yeah. years. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's going to be available or is it already available? Yeah, so the tricky thing about our implementation is our implementation talks to our uh, Facebook stack in PHP and things like this. And this is not mm -hmm. like reusable. So the way it's going to, uh, we're going to open source this is we're going to give a specification of the language. So a grammar and like what uh, things means. And we're going to provide custom implementations for uh, popular things. So we're going to have a node uh, non modules that learns that knows how to take a graphical response and talk to MySQL or Postgres or MongoDB and return it. And so from this like uh, prototype like reference implementation, then people are going to be able to use it to uh, adapt it to their backend. Great. So there'll be a specification and uh, an implementation out there. I tell you what, you guys announced React Native. You got Relay coming out. You got GraphQL coming out. You're really good at building buzz for your open source products. Um, yeah. You were able to announce React Native is now available, <laughs> which means most of our listeners have already quit listening. They're out there yes. playing re with React Native. <laughs> we, I, I asked on Twitter last night uh, if people had questions you know, for the React team, and it was, when can we get Relay? When can we get yes. GraphQL? They're chomping at the bits. Can you give us anything as far as like what we're looking at for these uh, frameworks and, and tools? So a few months. So, yeah, same like uh, we announced Relay, but we didn't expect like that crazy amount of hype uh, from it. <laughs> so we're like, oh, we're going to explain like GraphQL and Relay. And like people are going to like say, oh, yeah, this is a good idea. And then like move on. But like they didn't. And now like we're asked like every single day, like when is it coming out, when is it coming out. So like the entire GraphQL team and Relay team, uh, shifted focus. They uh, stopped doing any development, and they are just focused on open source. So, like in a couple of months, you're going to be able to use it. Sorry for the wait. Yeah, <laughs> I think you guys will know better next time. That uh, yep. next time you announce and pre-announce something, that they'll be knocking your door. They've got flint a little bit too on the on the pre-announce even of of Facebook or sorry React Native too. Is that you know how yeah. can you announce something that's not actually out there yet? Although yeah. you do have an app in the wild, so that, that does make some sense. Seems like with GraphQL, um, you know, if the I'm not obviously here to like prioritize your guys' <laughs> workloads or anything, but like if the specific uh, similar to how with Flux, like you guys release Flux as an yep. idea, as a as a description. Uh, GraphQL obviously will need some sort of specification if it's gonna have multiple implementations. You know, if the specification could at least be yep. um shared. front as far as that, then yeah. other people could hop on it. Because obviously Everybody has their own backend stacks and, and data stores. Yeah. So we can start having that ecosystem similar to Fluxes, perhaps, while we wait for you know your guys' canonical implementation. Yeah, that's definitely the first step. Uh, and the guys are working on coming up with the, the full like um, spec for the, the language. Um, but unfortunately, like it came about pretty quickly when we were first implementing it, racing to build the new um, iOS app. And there's definitely some warts. Um, so they're working on trying to smooth out some of those warts that we've been living with for a while. Uh, so that the community doesn't have to have to deal with them, um, and so they're they're trying to figure that out as quickly as they can, and then they'll uh, they'll put something out there. It sounds like you guys might have gotten kicked out of your room too during this conversation. You guys <laughs> moved around over there? Yeah, we did. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually good timing, anyways, because we're we're about to close up. We could probably drill a little further on a couple of thoughts here, but uh, you know, one of the things that you guys pointed out, I'd love to have you back on the show whenever this becomes more and more real. Um, around React Native as the component library. Whenever that's, you know, whenever you can release something new about that, please keep in touch because that's we'll something do. that's, you know, for me particularly is is uh, perked my ears up because I was thinking, geez, that'd be so nice to, to be able to, you know, learn one place to, to use React JS and um, and have that library available. But well, guys, thank you so much for joining me and Jared on this call today. I know that uh, everyone's pretty excited about React itself, but then also React Native coming out. Uh, huge announcement, Flux, uh, the, the idea there, but then Relay coming and GraphQL coming later uh, in a few months. That sounds pretty cool. So 
let's close the show there. And, and with that, uh, thanks everybody for listening. And we'll we'll say goodbye now. So bye bye. Great. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah.